Thank you for listening to SPN, the Savage Podcasting Network. You're listening to The Stephen Savage Show on the Savage Podcasting Network. And now here's your host, film and television director, Stephen Savage. Thank you, Andrea. Greetings, everyone. Savage here with you for the final episode of the 2023 season of The Stephen Savage Show, the official podcast of the Idlewild International Festival of Cinema, coming up on its 15th year, March 5th through the 10th, in the picturesque Alpine Village of Idlewild, California, just two hours east of Los Angeles, but a world away at over a mile high, sitting atop beautiful Mount San Jacinto. And as my audience is well aware, the podcast has been on hiatus since uh, this past April to make room for my uh, my own film and television work schedule, which has luckily enough gotten pretty hectic these past few months. Um, we have posted a few archived episodes during that time to fill up the empty space, and today's episode will be the last of those for this year. After the new year, I, I have a ton of great guests coming on, some return guests and some who haven't graced the podcast uh, as of yet. So we're excited for the, the 2024 season. So without further ado, here's one of my favorite episodes ever. And we received a lot of really nice messages about this one when it first aired from way back in 2016, my interview with the prolific award-winning songwriter Candy Parton. I hope you enjoy it this second time around and we'll be back in the new year. Uh, podcasting from our brand new and newly named Cranium Wheel Studios uh, with new content and film festival news and all that good stuff. So for myself, our producer, Trinity Houston, and the entire Savage Podcasting Network staff, Happy New Year and may your 2024 be everything you hope it will. Thanks. For today's show, it's my pleasure to introduce a woman whom I've known for quite a few years, to say the least, and I've been trying to get her uh, on the show for quite some time, but as with many of my more prominent guests um, with hectic schedule, she, she's she been um, a little bit hard to pin down, but finally I got her. <laughs> she's uh, a prolific songwriter whose career and body of work has been, well, nothing short of phenomenal. She's um, I'm going to go through the list here that I've got. She's written for She's written for and had her music covered by the likes of, uh, let's see, Johnny Mathis, Dionne Warwick, B.B. King, Conway Twitty, uh, Helen Reddy, and even the legendary Frank Sinatra, to name but a few of the iconic artists who my guest is linked to musically. And now it's my great honor to have her with me tonight on the show, calling in from her home in the greater Palm Springs area, Ms. Candy Parton. Candy, how are you, my friend? I'm fine, Steve. How are you doing? I am awesome. Now that I've got you here, I'm really good. I've been looking. I know it, it took a while. <laughs> I've been looking, looking forward to this. But um, I've known you. Uh, you know, I, I, I know you've got a lot going on always with with career and family and friends. And so, I'm always one of those people who's patient. You're you're well worth uh, waiting for, as I've told you in the past. <laughs> well, thank thank you. The hour's not over yet. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to date either one of us. Uh, suffice it. Suffice it to say, um, I've known you for a very long time, and you were you were one of the earliest supporters of my own career through music and uh, my time at AM, A&M Records through my film career, which you've told me you keep an eye on from time to time. And I have to tell you, you've really been a big inspiration uh, in both entertainment and in my life. And I, I'm very f- proud to call you my friend, Candy. Thanks. Well, thank you, Steve, and I feel the same way. I mean, you've always been part of the family uh, in my my book. Uh, I think, I think when uh, Shelley first brought you home, I <laughs> as her boyfriend, I think that's when we fell in love with you. Oh, your sister Shelley, yeah, she's yeah uh, one of my very first girlfriends and one of my fondest memories. <laughs> yeah, well, we always consider you part of the family. Oh, so that's great. So there. Great. Well, I love that. Um, and you're one of those people who who's really done her best to fly under the radar, so to speak. I mean, it's it's easy to find your work listed on the internet, but your personal life, you've kept pretty close to the vest. And uh, like, I, I there's no, as far as I know, no Wikipedia page about you. Your Facebook page is pretty low key. You don't have any big fan pages. It's something that's very admirable. I think uh, the privacy seems to be very important to you as an artist and a mom and and everything. 
Well, it's it's funny. Um, I never thought of it um, as keeping it private, although I, I guess I do. I guess I do. I, and I don't have any fan pages. I don't I don't really feel the need for them. I think the people that have have, have had occasion to come across my work have let me know, which is great. I mean, that's always fun. Um, but, uh, I haven't really tried to keep it low profile. I've just, uh, I've just been under the radar. So, <laughs> well, I've talked to a few, there are a few friends of mine, my friend, Alan Levy, who was just on my show. He's a very prominent, uh, TV director and, uh, he does, he's the same way, you know, he's, he just, it's not that he's, he's, uh, hiding in a cave, but he just, he just prefers not to be out there like, you know pushing himself on everybody and it, i just i think it's kind of cool i like it like that oh well thank you thank you it, it suits me <laughs> i like to start on my interviews by letting my audience get to know my guests through their own um personal journey as i like to say so if you don't mind i'd like to talk a little bit about your life as an artist and a songwriter basically how you got started what what made you kind of decide i'm gonna i'm gonna write songs in your first real break etc and okay. uh, all the way to putting together your own publishing and then off to the races. Okay, well, um, as far as being a songwriter, um, my mother always told me that I made up songs uh, when I was very small. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, the first song I made up was about Mamie Eisenhower. So I am dating, <laughs> I am dating myself. <laughs> yeah. That was your first song? <laughs> yes. And I rhymed Eisenhower with Ice Cold Shower. So... <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. great. So I went from there to writing other little songs and then poetry. Mm -hmm. But I always thought I'd grow up to be a physician. That's what I always wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I realized I just didn't have the stamina to go to medical school. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and in the meantime, I, I I picked up guitar when I was about thirteen and started taking lessons. And I never became a, a guitar player, but I was, it was able to pick out enough melody to uh, go along with my lyrics so I could present them to uh, early on the publishers. And uh, the earliest, um, also in, in the interim, there was also the, the American mm -hmm. Song Festival really gave me a boost. Mm -hmm. um, I entered it for three years in a row with nothing, not even an honorable mention. Mm -hmm. And in the fourth year, I entered some of the same songs and won um, top country uh, 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 in a, uh, in a um, with a song um, you'd already, you'd previously uh, years a year before you had entered before. Yeah, you, I wow. I'd sent it. I had already I had already pitched the song to the American Song Festival mm -hmm. and. and by the fourth year, I evidently they liked something that they heard, and and uh, so it was, I co-wrote it with Mark Gray, uh, who recently passed. And he was a good buddy of mine and a great, great singer. He was the lead singer in Exile, mm. and and uh, and he was uh, a heck of a fun guy to write with. Mm. So well, we wrote a song called "Somewhere There's a Fire Burning," and they it hit struck a chord. So we we got a lot of attention from that, and then. Um, off, off and on through the years, I've, I've always made money. After that first, uh, third year, I've always made money in American Song Festival. So I thought, well, this will work. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this this might work. And I was in the meantime, I was I was definitely into music. I was so into music. I was, I was into Bob Dylan. I was into Joan Baez. I was into Peter Paul and Mary. I was, of course, into the Beatles. Um, uh, and, my, and also. My mother used to play uh, show tunes around the house, mm -hmm. so I I got that along with the big band uh, exposure too. So uh, as far as my songwriting, I, I I think my first break was the American Song Festival mm -hmm. uh, because I had not had a a song published uh, until 1973. And it was uh, from a, a young man who was living in, one, I think, in Laurel Canyon at the time. Mm -hmm. 
and he somehow heard uh, <laughs> a demo tape of mine, and I was so green, I was so very very green at the time. Mm-hmm. I sent I sent him an eleven song demo, <laughs> 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 which which is, is verboten. It's, you just don't do that. All but right. I had no idea that you didn't do that. Mm-hmm. So I did my little wall and sack two track thing and sent him a, a tape. And at which point he said he would be able to work with me. Uh, he called me on the phone and said he'd love to be able to work with me, but to never, ever, ever send out <laughs> 11, 11 song memo tape again. Right. Uh, that's <laughs> funny. I know people that actors will send me six minute long uh, acting reels. <laughs> really? <laughs> I write them back. And I say, you know, you had me at thirty seconds. <laughs> right? Yeah, you're you either you either got it or you haven't got it. It's not, <laughs> right. Time is kind of like, yeah. right. So I it was funny because I was thinking about you not long ago. I wrote. A, I just read. Excuse me. I just read a book called Hotel California, which isn't really about the Eagles or that song. It's about. It's about the. Um, the amazing community of artists, songwriters, singer songwriters that lived in Laurel Canyon in uh, in the late '60s through the early '70s, and when they developed that what they called the California sound. And I know that you and I, in the way in the past, had talked about some of those artists. And I'm wondering how much in that era were you uh, were you actually involved with some of those people it seems maybe a little early for you I think it was it was a little early mm-hmm. for me I you know I, I, I got married very early mm-hmm. and I had kids very young mm-hmm. and so I was well into the to the I was well on the mom track uh-huh. when the song when the songwriting started to keep emerging mm-hmm. so to speak mm-hmm. Um yeah, yeah. I I don't I don't remember them. I I only uh, I came later to the canyons. <laughs> yeah, I, I I it's another amazing story. We could go on about that, but how people like you I, I admire so much who are able to juggle family and their musical career or their acting career, and it's wow, it's it's not easy just being on your own, being responsible for your own career, let alone with the responsibility of a family. So that's pretty. Well, yeah, it it was, uh, my kids got used to seeing me go into kind of a trance and then running, (laughs) running for my book to write in. I, 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 I I trained them early to, or just leave me alone until they got it written down. (laughs) And your daughter, uh, Laurel, she's, she's pretty much into the music now too, correct? Yes, she has, um, she had a band for 12 years called trauma team. Mm -hmm. And she was a lead singer, and, and uh, she played guitar, rhythm guitar. And um, I only got to see her once, unfortunately, in, and that was in Nashville at a club that, I, I mean, it was jammed. We were out on the, on the sidewalk to listen to her. Mm-hmm. But, um, but she, she, uh, she's got quite an energetic style. Hmm. Well, let's, let's talk about something that's really kind of one of the things I've always been in awe of your songwriting ability is your versatility. You jump seems like seamlessly from one style to the other, you know, to I've, I've heard you go from sort of a pop style to a, to a American crooner type of style songwriting to, to country, uh, rock and roll stuff, um, um, bringing songs to uh, various recording artists, crossing genres, et cetera. In order to have that versatility, you must have had some influencers or fa- favorite songwriters who who stuck out in your mind. Who influenced you early on? Well, my because I was so involved in the folk scene or uh, the folk scene early, I listened to a lot of Dylan, a lot of mm-hmm. Bob Dylan, mm-hmm. and um, and and through Peter Paul and Mary, I mean, obviously a lot of obviously a lot of wonderful songs came to them, with Pete Seeger and. Uh, you know, and they did. They covered a lot of Dylan songs too, mm-hmm. and so um, that was pretty much uh, that, along with Joan Baez and um, Judy Collins and the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they are uh, that. They influenced me quite a, quite a bit. Yeah, I, I would think. say I would say Dylan's work influenced me heavily. Mm. Because it does seem like, and I don't know, maybe it has something to do with the partners, the songwriting partners as well that you've hooked up with over the years, that maybe you're just one of those people that's been able to go from one partner who's writing in one genre to another and just and just be able to keep up with them and, and fall into it. So that's that's also kind of a gift. 
Well, it's it. Yeah, it, um, I, I I guess it's a gift. Uh, I never thought about it, but I do like the fact that I'm able to work in 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 different genres. Mm-hmm. Uh, it satisfies my need for variety. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, and two things. I've if I've learned two things about myself. I, I have a high need for play and a high need for variety. <laughs> so songwriting fulfills both of those if you're doing them right. Right, exactly. Now, I don't know how much in, in the last few years you've been, um, I don't know how much you've been exploring, you know, what's happening in the music business in general, but uh, it seems to me like, you know, the age of the singer-songwriter became the age of the band who one or two members was writing a lot, a lot of songs for the band but um how different do you think it is nowadays as it was when you were first starting off to be that person who writes songs puts demos out and gets them to various artists well um i'd say it wasn't easy when i started it was not easy to do that to get a publisher's attention Mm -hmm. or an artist's attention but it has become much more difficult uh, as time has gone on mm-hmm. because because a lot of the companies publishing companies um, and or production companies associated with an artist will keep their own little stable of writers and mm-hmm. just use write use uh, material out of that pool that their writers produce right and there was uh, it was a lot the field was a lot more open and uh, you you could actually call up a publisher's office and ask to have a meeting with somebody who would listen to your songs. Mm. Uh, actually, I had never been turned down, which was kind of <laughs> remarkable. That's great. Uh, That's awesome. It was. I know it was great, and I mean, I had some um, early on. Um, Al Kasha, I took a class from him, and um, it was over a period of six weeks, I think. And uh, and he opened several doors for me. He he encouraged me in my writing when I was in his class, and then um, sweetheart that he was. He sent me to um, the head of uh, Capital Country in in Los Angeles, Mm -hmm. a wonderful guy named Frank Jones. And uh, I had a country song that I brought into him, and he let me play it for him. And and nothing came of it, but it was like one of those things where you go, oh, I can do that. You know, I, I, I can sit and play my own songs for people. Down the line, that turned out that I did not do that because there were a very early on, it, there were much better singers than I that could could do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, uh, you, you know, that was that's how that turned out. Yeah, that's another strength that people don't realize is a strength, and in my in filmmaking, it definitely is. But uh, um, Robin Williams once said, D- "Decide what you are and be that." And I I know what my strengths are, and it sounds like that's been. Uh, uh, something you've always known and you 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 kind of pursued your strengths rather than well you know a lot of people oh i want to be a singer no matter once well, no matter what instead of going you know maybe i don't have those chops maybe my chops is here you know writing this stuff right that was i mean i would have loved to have been a singer i mean i'd love to sing mm-hmm. uh, in fact one of my favorite quotations in the world is god respects me when i work but mm-hmm. he loves me when i sing <laughs> yeah, and uh and i it used to hang in the uh where I, we hung our choir ropes when mm-hmm. i was a member of a church that i sang in the choir and i love that um i uh well, what was the your original question no i was just it was actually just an observation that it seems oh, okay. to me you're one of those pe- persons who really knows what your strengths are and you and you concentrate on those and focus and that's a he, that's another gift you know yeah, that was, I mean, I did learn early enough that it was like, um, you know, I, I can do that, but not not as well as I would have, like I would like to have somebody else do it. Right. Yeah. And so I, w- I wasn't conflicted about being a singer or a songwriter. I was a songwriter mm-hmm. who had to sing on occasion. Right. <laughs> how, how much uh, in the past, how much freedom, when, when an artist decides to take on one of your songs, how much freedom would that artist have with with your tunes when it came to interpreting a song how, how much interaction did you have uh with like i was just um my friend eric bork who was one of the writers of band of band of brothers for hbo and they were working with the guy who wrote the book band of brothers um 
And uh, he, I asked him, how much did was that guy around, you know, to watching you interpret him? And he said he wasn't. He was just he was never there. So uh, yeah. was Stephen Ambrose. And uh, so how much interaction um, did artists did you have with the artists who were recording your songs? Well, as far as their interpretation, um, not really much. You just kind of <laughs> you just kind of have to sit back and let what's going to evolve evolve. Mm -hmm. I mean, their producer will have a say in how the song is sung. Mm -hmm. um, the artist will have a say in how they do it. If you produce a demo that is pretty straightforward and has some interesting extra licks in it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they may go ahead and keep that in the arrangement or they may decide to entirely change it. Mm -hmm. Over the years, I've been pretty lucky because I've gotten some wonderful covers of songs of mine um, that I, I really thought I couldn't hear anybody doing it any better. Mm. And one of those is, is with um, when Helen Reddy cut um, a song of mine um, called The Winner in Your Eyes. And I thought um, the guy I wrote it with, Randy Goodrum, who wrote "Bluer Than Blue" and mm. "You Needed Me," "You Needed Me," um, said he he had been trying to pitch that song to Ann Murray for three years, mm -hmm. and and Randy wrote the music. Mm -hmm. And he he said at one point, he says she wouldn't take it if I I stapled a dollar to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, anyways, it was it was an odd story, but in uh, up in Columbia Records back. At, before it was Sony mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, all, all the producers used to have offices on the same floor, mm -hmm. and their offices would generally be open and the music playing. And um, Johnny Mathis's producer had liked some of my songs very early on, and uh, so I had a, an, an open door there. And uh, Mathis's producer Jack Gold was playing uh, a, a winner in your eyes, and. Uh, Helen Reddy's producer was going down the hall mm. and he happened, he happened to hear the song. And so he pops his head in and he says, are you doing that song with Johnny? And Jack says, well, no, uh, it's not exactly right for Johnny, but he says, okay, then I'd like it for Helen Reddy. <laughs> so that's how, th that's how that happened. That's awesome. That's such a good story. Those, those stories like that are amazing. That just, if he'd have gone to the restroom and not made it down the hall <laughs> during the course exactly. of the song. That is funny. I, I, exactly. And, uh, and they made, the two of them made a record that I, I, I just, I, in my own mind, I can't think of anybody who would do it any better. Hmm. What, what is have you ever gotten jaded in, in when it comes to hearing one of your songs on the radio? Does that is that always no, been a thrill? It's always a thrill. Yeah, it's always a thrill. It's it's just one of the perks you, you get when you know from doing the work, right? And it's it's you know it's eighty five percent work, and the rest is mm -hmm. is some of those bonuses you get, like hearing it on the radio and. Mm -hmm. Or having somebody say, "Gee, I really like that. He did a nice job on that song." Yeah. But um, and you know, and if you're um, if you're in the studio and, and able to influence an artist, which I, I really never tried to do because I never was in that position except for one time, mm. <laughs> and I was in a Johnny Mathis had done several of my songs over the course of about two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And so I'd known him a while. And uh, he he had invited me to dinner at his house, and we'd hung out, and we'd gone to the races together, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, one day I get this weird idea that I, I, I got an assignment when I was at Elmo Irving Publishing Company, which is A&M. Mm -hmm. um, they had a song uh, a movie theme by Philippe Sard, the French composer, mm -hmm. and they wanted an English lyric. And so I wrote an English lyric to it, and they liked that. Then they wanted to hear um, a demo. They wanted they wanted to hear a demo. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got the idea that Johnny Bamfus's voice would sound just great, <laughs> on, just great on my demo. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> I, I thought, that is when great. I look back now, I went. 
What were you thinking? <laughs> what were you smoking? What What were you doing? <laughs> they say that bumblebees aren't supposed to fly. They're not aerodynamically set up for it. But somebody forgot to tell the bumblebees you can't do those things. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's like here I am. I mean, I had poor John had to. We had to get a, a special um, authorization from his attorney mm-hmm. that the, that the demo wouldn't be used for anything other than a demo, right. which cost John probably five hundred bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and so the the day of the demo, I'm I'm at um, at I'm in one of the studios on the A and M lot, um, and we're waiting for Johnny to arrive, mm-hmm. and people start coming over from the publishing company just to sort of see how bad spectacle this is going to be when he doesn't show. Mm. So <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting there waiting and I'm totally confident oh, of course. that he's, that he's going to come. <laughs> and, uh, and so he, he, that he arrives, he arrives and, uh, in the only time I ever made a comment about it, an artist, uh, a phrasing was one time during the demo and i just said can we do it one more time john and he said sure <laughs> and, and as i said that i went what are you doing <laughs> you lost your mind well imagine what the people around you were thinking <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what they thought but they, <laughs> who is this I, woman <laughs> <laughs> that's well, funny they, they kept thinking they kept coming over and, and like the studio was small yeah it's it'd be like it'd be like a filmmaker going, you know, I'm going to make a short film, a spec film, and uh, yeah, Tom Cruise is showing up to. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's funny. I know. I know. Uh, well, Johnny was so sweet on the phone. I I just asked him. I said, I have a favor to ask you, and he said, What is it? And I said, I've got this song that I know your voice should be on it. Mm-hmm. It should just be on it. And I said, Would you consider doing a demo for me? And he says. A demo, and <laughs> and I said, he says, he says I've never done a demo, <laughs> and he says I you know I had a record deal when I was nineteen, right. so he, I said I never had to do a demo. He, he said <laughs> De- Dion and Gladys Knight all had to do demos, but he says I never had to do one. Wow. And then he said he said sure I'll do it, and I thought. My God, I can't, it was just that easy. All I had to do is ask him. Well, see, there's why you should have a Wikipedia page because they're right there. You, you wrote the song for Johnny Johnny Mathis's first demo. <laughs> <laughs> he was already a superstar, but that was his first demo. Oh, yeah, right. that was his first. And I gave him that following Christmas. I got a gold engraved, um, uh, a key ring for him, and that, and a play on. Um, the uh, inscription on it said to the utmost demo singer mm-hmm. and he loved that <laughs> he loved that he says oh i'm putting that on now that's great <laughs> i know you've got so many stories tell us just a few like that just some of the highlights who that come to mind some of the people that you've enjoyed working with or hearing cover your songs uh, you know I, my listeners love to hear stuff just just like that just the good stuff you know that so many so many interview shows and podcasts are all about the the, the bad things that happen to people and i it's kind of, i like hearing the the great stuff tell us some of the highlights well it's it's been it's been great it's been, it's been a long career which has been wonderful um i uh some of the high, you know, you asked me a question a little while back about something that influenced me that mm-hmm. set me uh, to to move, moving ahead in the music industry. Mm-hmm. And one of them, one of the things was, um, I saw a uh, I went to the Troubadour one night and Hoy Axton was headlining, wow. and so, and some kid named John Denver was opening for him, <laughs> and. So I sat there and I was, you know, I thought, okay, well, I'll suffer through the opening act, but I had no idea who John Denver was. Mm-hmm. But um, when he was done with the set, I thought, that's what I want to do with my music, that, at that with my lyrics. I want to connect with people like that. Mm-hmm. And it was a real epiphany for me. And, um, and of course, I watched John go up and up and up and up and he was kind enough to include me in in a lot of nice events um and um and always at 
always when he was in town, I got a call to, to come to the show, which was very nice of him. That's mm-hmm. the working with Sinatra, even though I don't know if you actually got to work with you know, him directly. You know what? I don't, I don't, that's an error. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I have no idea how I got associated with that. Oh, okay. For some reason, there's uh, online, they said that Sinatra, in one of his greatest hits album, there's an added track that it says that you were a partner, a writing partner on. So I, I didn't know because it seems like well, that's you, something I'd know about. You know what? It could happen because strange things like that happen I mean, with songs. It, they are, they pop up. I found one recently that I had recorded with uh, I, I wrote, uh, co-wrote with John Barry, the film composer. On uh, we worked on a movie called Francis, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't know whether you know John's work or not. He uh, did Out of Africa and mm-hmm. uh, Somewhere in Time. I'm a filmmaker. And dances I know. with dances <laughs> with folks. Right, oh, right. So anyway, uh, John and I wrote the song for the movie Francis, and mm-hmm. it just wasn't right for the end credits. You know, it just I, I knew it. John knew it. Mm-hmm. And so it was shelved. Well, I looked in YouTube the other day, and lo and behold, here's the song recorded by Sarah Brightman. And wow. and and I had no idea how she even got a hold of the, the thing. Because mm. as far as I knew, uh, when John went back to New York after we wrote here, uh, he did the demo and then nothing else happened to it. So mm-hmm. I, I have no, I still have no idea how, how she found it. But well, thank God for YouTube. You better look into the Sinatra thing because you never know. <laughs> That's right. funny. You should check that out. But... I actually check it out. <laughs> I mean, really, stranger things have happened. I mean, I... yeah, I actually saw the uh, the song credit, uh, the song list on the uh, that's listed on the uh, uh, CD version of the song of uh, the. Uh, excuse me, of Sinatra's, one of his greatest hits album that came out in the later, I think in the 90s, maybe early 90s, I can't remember. You should check it out because you are listed as a writer on one of those songs. Okay. Oh, well, I've got all, yeah, the, that's, all this time. That's, that's phenomenal that I'm talking to somebody who may have a song on a Sinatra <laughs> and you're going, hmm, never knew about it. <laughs> no, I mean, that's... Uh... <laughs> And uh, uh, Tom Scott and I used to write a lot together. We wrote for te- a television series and uh, and for movies. Mm-hmm. And um, he was one of my favorite writers to to write with for for that kind of thing because we both were just we just sort of, both sort of vibe on the on the same level. Mm-hmm. And uh, he got my humor and I got his humor and uh, you know I when I first came up to visit him and see if we were going to be able to work together, if we were going to like each other, I came up with under my arm. I had all like my credits, all my albums that mm-hmm. I, cred- I had credits on. And so he looked, he looked at them. He took them from me under my arm. He says, he says, you can either do the job or you can't do the job. He <laughs> says, I don't, I don't care what you've done. It's what you can do. Right. So he and I uh, went on to, to do some good work that I, I really liked. Yeah. And I know that you were asking one time about favorite genres, mm-hmm. or and I, I really like working within the confines of uh, of a script or um, uh, of a script. Uh, it it gives me the, the parameters, uh, and then you're free to work within that instead of having to come up with a whole new idea mm-hmm. for a song. Yeah, I was so gonna. You, I was gonna ask you about writing specifically for film. I know you've done you've done a lot of that in the past, and uh, I, I think I think as a songwriter, that must be a, another challenge that comes your way, and it's probably a lot of fun. Uh, it is a lot of fun, and it's it's really a lot of fun when you when you are writing with somebody who looks at it the same way, mm-hmm. um, and who has the who also have this the same commercial sensibilities mm-hmm. because. You can get hooked up in some strange writing relations, as you probably know as an artist yourself, mm-hmm. that, that you know, it's just not working. And, you know, for whatever reason, the, the chemistry is not there. Right. But with the ones that it is, it's so obvious. It's like, oh, of course, you know. So that's the way Tom and I were. We are uh, we are uh, we became good friends and, and good collaborators. Hmm. You know, I I've something I've 
was thinking about asking you. I don't know if it was on our original when we'd originally talked about the podcast and you're coming on, but the so many award shows tonight uh, nowadays, the Grammys, the Billboard Awards, and now all the MTV stuff. And uh, your thoughts on those events as a as a songwriter? They've they've changed over the years, and uh, I'm just wondering when. Like the Grammys, it it just seems to me that a lot of people are are just getting getting Grammys because they sell so much. And uh, but there's something about the Grammys that seems to hold tight the organization itself onto its past, and they have they have a lot of categories that that um, you wouldn't even think about. You know, best Hungarian opera or right. <laughs> it's funny. Right. But what do you what do you think about the about the those awards? Well, I, you know, I, I think it's nice for people to be recognized for their work. Mm-hmm. Um, my personal opinion is that not always the work that is recognized is the best work. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just something that, you know, you know, maybe you unfortunately have one of your songs that you don't care for so much mm-hmm. come be very popular, which has happened to some people and it, and it comes back to haunt them. Yeah. So, it's interesting, but, even in, in it's like uh, film is the same way. I remember Jethro Tull winning for best metal artist, and Ian Anderson, the uh, lead singer, he said in an interview, "What the hell was that? <laughs> why were we? <laughs> <laughs> why were we?" And Judy Dench, um, it's funny because she won best supporting actress for Shakespeare in Love. She was on screen all of three minutes. And she said, the shame is, I mean, I'm I'm happy for the award, but there were so many great women up for it that year. The shame is I did another movie that same year that wasn't even mentioned, you know, and uh, was really uh-huh. proud of that work. And it's like Whoopi Goldberg. She won Best Supporting Actress for Ghost. And that was just it was just slapstick farce that she did in that movie. Whereas exactly that same year, she came out with the long walk home with Sissy Spacek where she played, it was about the, uh, the, the bus boycotts and, uh, and she, and Whoopi was so amazing in that movie. And that movie just got passed over and her performance wasn't even mentioned, but yeah, I I find it very funny. The awards. (laughs) I I think they, I think they definitely are influenced by sales. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I really do. Uh, you know, I I don't. When I moved to Nashville in 1988, mm-hmm. I uh, I had gotten to the point where I used to pick up Billboard, or I we had a subscription at that at that point, probably where uh, I I would look at the charts and I would go, I have no idea what's going on in the pop charts. Mm-hmm. I, I saw hip hop and I saw rap groups and I saw that's about all I was seeing. Mm-hmm on the pop charts and I, I thought well um i can't be competitive in this area so i i had thought about moving to Ma- nashville years before and i thought well i'm going to do it now you know mm-hmm. well, oh, because i don't see any future for me in, in terms of how i write in this community right it's I, it, I w- it's like a, it's something that just an epiphany that things are changing and why why you know paddle up a stream that you're not even all that interested in trying to compete with when there are other places sure exactly mm-hmm. and and i've seen other friends of mine do do the same mm-hmm. you know where they 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 kind of get a little more specified with their their goals and and try not to be you know you just i think the best part of I mean, being a working songwriter is very, very cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I've never had made so much money that I, like some friends of mine who say, I have more dough than I know what to do with. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, uh, that's a literal quote from yeah. a friend of mine. That's funny. Uh, <laughs> after he'd had, I, I think he's, I think he'd had his 15th number one. Wow. It, there you go. <laughs> it's like somebody said once about uh, having, um, F you money and F me money. F you money is so much money that you can tell everybody to F off. But F me money is when I can actually hurt myself just to get revenge. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to lose a million dollars doing this, but man, I'm going to have fun. Boy, I could have fun. (laughs) (laughs) What's up? What you've been through? We were just talking about Nashville. Do you have a favorite musical town? I mean, L.A. isn't anymore. It used to be San Francisco. They both used to be considered musical towns, and now it's Nashville. I love Austin. I love, you know, what's your your favorite musical place? 
Well, it's um, well, it's it's kind of a a fifty fifty deal. I mean, I I used to love to work in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. It was my hometown, and um, I I knew the city like I knew the back of my hand. I mean, mm-hmm. I I I knew how to navigate anywhere around um, in case the freeway freeways were too clogged to drive, and uh, I. Uh, but I, I, I also loved Nashville. I spent 10 great years there, 10 really exciting years. And um, basically, it was the winter weather, uh, uh, the ice storms that, that drove me back to California. Mm-hmm. It wasn't the um, – I, I, I had a lot of friends, and I certainly missed them and continue to miss them. Uh, so I try to get down there every couple of years and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and see. But I went down there um, – I had – um, I had written with Becky Hobbs, uh, who's I've had the most success with as a collaborator. We had a number one um, with Conway Twitty called um, I Want to Know You Before We Make Love. Mm-hmm. And before Conway had done it, uh, Alabama had cut it. Oh, right. Um, it's one of these things on how you get songs to people. Uh-huh. Well, well I, um, one time years before this a- actual event happened, um, Becky Hobbs and I were at a fan fair, which is held every June for the fans of country music to come and meet their the the people, meet the stars. Mm-hmm. And I just happened to be chatting up uh, Randy Owen from Alabama, and uh, I mentioned something about Becky Hobbs, and he says, "I've never met her. Will you introduce us? Introduce me to her?" And I said, "Sure." So I met. I introduced Becky and Randy and. And there, and then cut to ten years later, um, Becky knows Randy, and she knows where he hangs out. So she just moseys on over to his publishing company, and happens to catch him in the office and puts a demo tape in his hand. Mm. And two days later, he calls her and says, "We're doing it." And uh, so we were, we were hoping that Alabama was going to have a single on it, and they were. And then their record label decided that they wanted to put out a greatest hits album. Mm. So uh, our single got dropped. It would have been the fourth single on the on the CD that was the forty hour week album. Wow. So so uh, that was it. It, it was just it, crazy stuff like that. I mean, you she, you know, you you run into somebody at the supermarket and you happen to have a demo on you. You know, <laughs> right? And I always went prepared to do that. Mm. I always did. No, said that's my God. I'm just envisioning you now having uh, a bunch of cassette tapes in your purse. <laughs> well, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's oh yeah. I've, I've, I've put I've put them on people's uh, Rolls Royces when they've been at dinner and said I didn't <laughs> want to disturb them. Right. And I usually get calls back. Mm. I usually got calls back, which is kind of nice. Mm. This is a. Uh, go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. Yeah, oh, go I ahead. was just I was just saying this is a, an age where we're seeing people who. In the 50s and 60s, their careers would have been over when they reached a certain age. I just spent, uh, I just spent some time in Nash, excuse me, in Nashville, in Vegas. Um, you know, my friends uh, from the band Queen. Um, I was invited, you know, do the backstage pass, and they were playing at the MGM Grand in in Vegas, and I went there, and I'm watching, like especially my friend Roger Taylor, the drummer for Queen. He's he does a complete hour and a half, almost two hour show on those drums. And it's I go, man, this these guys would have would have been over with so long ago. But now there's just everybody saying, you know what, I can keep going on into my 80s. If I want. Yeah. And I remember the line from the movie Almost Famous, the Cameron Crowe film, where there's this new a uh, manager who comes into the band and he says, you've got to get your money while you can, because do you think Mick Jagger is going to be rocking at 45? <laughs> <laughs> right. it's, it's a great line. And, yeah, it's uh, a great line. And, uh, but so I wanted to ask you about your own future. What, what are you doing in the songwriting world? And, and, uh, and where would you like to, to be? Let's say in five years, would you, have you thought about producing um, other artists? Have you thought about just what, what, what do you think? Uh, well, I don't know how hard I want to work. <laughs> um, although I do, uh, what interests me most uh, lately is encouraging new talent. Mm. Uh, and I really enjoy doing that. And um, I um, uh, there's the, the the girl that I mentioned, uh, uh, T. 
to you, a Katie Feesby in Ireland. Mm-hmm. She's reviving her career. I love at this her. Point. She's great. Thank you. Isn't for, she thank great? You, thank you for turning me on to her. She's amazing. You're welcome. There's also a guy that she works that she sings with. His name is Jer O'Donnell, mm-hmm. and he's pretty awesome too. Mm-hmm. I I definitely look for both of them to do something. Yeah, she's she's phenomenal. But I think that's great. I mean, I think that that um you know giving back is such a great thing but that's just you i mean i've always i've always known you to be that way you just always look look for potential in people and and you're willing to you know give them a a, a hand up and i think that's that's pretty nice well it's, you know it's like i'm i i will first last and always be a fan mm-hmm. i love other people's work i love hearing good work i mean um i'm i'm thrilled when some something happens to somebody that's really nice and that's a you know that you could go yeah i'm 100 percent behind that song and Mm -hmm. and you're really happy for them so uh, you know it's it's uh it's just part of my personality i Mm. just it's one of the things i do like about myself Mm. well that's one of the things i like about you too of the many (laughs) thank you we're so sweet steve we're about out of time for this episode and this was amazing to me, and I just looked up to see how much time it's gone by. And it seems like we just got on the phone a minute ago. That's that's great. Um, oh yeah. I want to thank my guest Candy Parton for calling in today. It's it's been so much fun, and and uh, I'm really grateful uh, that you took the time. Thanks so much. You're welcome. And just a reminder, you can find this show on iTunes and Spotify, and podbean.com and of course on the Savage Podcasting Network YouTube channel. So for Candy Parton and for myself, thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Thanks again, Candy.